Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy towards us. We thank you for another Sabbath. We pray as we look upon your word that we may truly understand that it is your word you're speaking to us. Help us to see that this word speaks to whoever we're sharing with. Let us re read this word with them. It may be the first time they've seen some of these scriptures and understood some of these thoughts. May they be constantly fresh to us. May we understand the privilege we have of knowing these things. Bless us now as we make preparation to help someone else. In Jesus' precious name, amen. We have uh, moved through scriptures now that have helped a person see how salvation works, how the steps uh, operate, that Jesus died for us, he took our penalty, that uh, the Christian is delivered from sin. And we are now going to move into a little bit more of what we talked last week, the, the unseen presence of Jesus. He is with us and in us. But now we want to talk about the next step. We are actually going to see him. <laughs> We're going to see him in person. And that's what we want to talk about this time. Jesus is coming back. Now, he came the first time. We've discussed a little bit of that, but we need to see that a little more clearly. In John 1, 29, it says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Now, that's just not for one person or two people or one church. It's the sin of the world. The whole world was involved with what he did. But he is called there the Lamb. And that's laying the foundation for something you will study with them later. In Isaiah 53, verses 6 and 7, it discusses the Lamb again. Isaiah 53, 6 and 7. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter. There it is. Jesus is the lamb in this very particular way. And as sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. There's just a lot to think about in those two scriptures. Jesus is the Lamb, and it shows here what it means to be a Lamb. Okay. In Hebrew, excuse me, Isaiah, so we're in Isaiah, let's stay there. Isaiah 55, verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Jesus came to bring pardon. Okay. So Jesus as the Lamb showed us the way. He is an example. And it also shows you that he came to bring pardon. He did that himself. Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 28. Hebrews 9, 28. This will allow the person to see the Bible actually says what you're studying here. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time. So Jesus came the first time, but it says he's going to appear the second time without sin unto salvation. There will be no sin involved when it comes by the second time for believers. Okay? So he's coming back in the salvation plan. 
So the scripture says at point blank, he's going to appear the second time. This is not just a New Testament concept. You want them to tie both of the Old and the New Testament together. So we need some Old Testament scriptures here. In uh, Job 19.25... Job 19.25, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. The latter day, of course, is when Jesus comes back, at the latter day. And that's a good scripture to know, because some people who think they're the latter day people. Okay. So this study becomes important for lots of reasons. At the latter day, he knows his Redeemer liveth, and that he's coming back. Psalm 50, verses 3 through 5. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth, that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. So God is coming. Jesus is coming. And it's not going to be a silent event. Once more you're laying some foundation here. A fire shall devour before him. It should be very tempestuous. There's going to be lots of activity. It's not going to be a quiet little secret thing. Very tempestuous. And he's going to gather his people to him. Isaiah 66, 15 and 16. Isaiah 66, uh, 15. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh and the slain of the Lord shall be many. So this is not a quiet event. It's just not something that's going to slip by. <laughs> this is going to catch everybody's attention. Notice it says here, all flesh. This is not just for one group of people. So this takes care of another teaching that's popular today. <laughs> they said there's going to be a big secret. There's no secret that I've seen in every way in the scriptures. This is not secret stuff. Daniel, the second chapter, verse 44 and 45. Daniel 2, verse 44, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest, the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass thereafter. The dream is certain, the interpretation thereof, sure. So this again lays the foundation for a study in Daniel to go back and see what, what these four kings are and what this is all about. But at the end of it all, it says in the, the days of these kings, God will set up a kingdom. It shall never be destroyed. That's part of another study. <laughs> By the way, when people ask you questions in the middle of your study, don't get sidetracked, okay? They will try to do that to you. They will hit you with a question and make your mind go off this way. No, stay with your study. Tell them. You know we're going to spend a whole time reading on that. So hold on because we'll have lots of things to say about that. <laughs> Don't get sidetracked. Okay. All right. So the second coming of Jesus is established in the scriptures, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we just read a couple here. But this is all you want to do in these readings with people. You don't want to flood them with scriptures. Just enough to see what's happening. All right, now, the question then has to come, what does it mean is second coming? We want to really get that down because there are churches, there are groups that teach that the second coming of Jesus is when you're converted. Yeah. 
I first ran into that at the seminary because we had to study the theological works of lots of people. But there it was. C.H. Dodd, for example. He says, when you're converted, that's the second coming for you. <laughs> well, that's one of the options. Other people teach the second coming is at death. When you die, then you're with Jesus. <laughs> there are others who teach that the second coming is a big secret when his people are taken from the earth. <laughs> and then there are others who say, he's already come. <laughs> and that's kind of interesting, isn't it? That people say he's already come. One group says that he came in 1915. Well, I wait for them to tell me about the communion services because Jesus said you only do that until he comes. Why are they still doing it? <laughs> There's just all kinds of ways people trip themselves up. You get these doctrines correctly lined up and all of a sudden error just sticks out when it shows itself. All right, so what about it? How is Jesus coming? You want to really make this clear now. Acts, the first chapter, verse 9. 9 through 11. This is, of course, after the resurrection. This is after Jesus has been on the earth. And he has just told them that uh, he's leaving and they're going to receive power. The Holy Spirit will come to them. And they're to go. And he outlines how they're to start. How they're to do their work. They're going to start at uh, Jerusalem start with God's church first. Isn't it interesting that when God begins the hardcore part of his movement, he begins in his own church. I have reminded pastors of that when they think I'm doing the wrong thing talking to our people. No, God said you start in the church <laughs> and then you start spreading out. The church has to be pure before he can bring them in. Okay, so Acts 1.9 when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up. Well, there you go. They're watching him. He was taken up and a cloud received him. A cloud represents angels, okay? So it says here, a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly, while the apostles were looking toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men. Ah, two of them came out of that cloud, see? Two men stood by them in white apparel, uh, which also they said, You men of Galilee, why are you standing there gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Now, what kind of a Jesus that just left? Was he a spirit? He was a real human, wasn't he? They saw a human, glorified human go. That was God, Jesus. They saw him go, and the apostles have been told now, the same Jesus, not a different one, the same Jesus that you see going is going to come back in the same way that you just saw him leave. Well, that's very clear. They saw him. It's not going to be some spiritual thing where he just comes to them at conversion. It's not going to be something where the list that we went through, the same way that he left is the way he's coming back, in person and visibly. You can see it with your eyes. It's an interesting thing. And this is on an aside now. This is not for your study. But I'm dealing with some more people uh, from a group that thinks they really have all these things down. And uh, I mentioned to them that they think they have a person who saw God. I said, John 1, 18, it says, no man has at any time seen God. And they thought about it for a second, and this time they brought one of the pros with them. One of the old guys, he had more gray hair than I had in here. <laughs> He, he said, well, don't you think it's possible for God to prepare somebody's eyes to see? 
I said, what do you mean? He said, well, at the transfiguration, Peter, you know, he saw these, these beings from heaven. And I looked at him, I said, well, I really don't understand what you're trying to tell me here. Because Moses was translated, and he was a human when he was translated. And Elijah, <laughs> uh, resurrected, excuse me, and then Elijah was translated. These were two humans. And when they came back, they were still humans. You don't have to have magic eyes to see a human when one's in front of you. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, but your example doesn't work. You have to come up with another one. Well, the same thing is happening here. When Jesus comes back, it's visible to every human. You don't need magic eyes. You don't have to have anything spiritually prepared to see him come. Everybody's going to see him. Even lost people are going to see him come. All right, so that's very important. <laughs> We're not going to study these things. Like <laughs> okay, so he's coming in person and visibly. Matthew 25, 31. Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. So Jesus, it says, is going to come with all of His angels. Now, we, we just read in Acts, the first chapter, that when He left, He went into the cloud. Well, the cloud's coming back with Him. <laughs> See? So it's going to be just the way it was told in Acts, the first chapter. Uh, Matthew 16, verse 27, says something very similar. For the Son of Man shall come in His glory, the glory of His Father, with His angels, and then shall He reward every man according to His works. And you just laid another little seed here. Works has something to do with something here. Okay? You want to keep a hold that we are redeemed by the merits of Jesus only, but there is a place for works. And we have to see what that is later with these people. Okay, so Jesus is coming back with his angels. That is established in uh, Revelation 19, verse 16. Just for yourself, so you know, have a context in case you get asked a question here. Verse 14 says, The armies which were in heaven followed him, Jesus, upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Okay, so there's those angels again. Verse 16, He hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. So when Jesus comes back, this time without sin unto salvation, He comes as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now remember, we are looking at the question, how does he come back? Visibly? Personally? As the king of kings? Glorious? Revelation 1-7. Revelation 1-7. Behold, he cometh with clouds. Well, there it says it again. <laughs> The clouds, the angels, it's all the same thing. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and what? Every. Every eye shall see him. And when the person throws out to you, now, oh, that's spiritualized. No, that, the scripture does not say that. <laughs> it says, every eye shall see him. They also which pierced him. Are they spiritual? <laughs> see? And all kindreds of the earth, that's everybody shall wail because of him. All right, so, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. You have now established something that's very difficult to break down, especially as we get further into this. Matthew 24, verse 23. Well, I'll give you all the verses. Matthew 23, 27, and 30. We'll look at those verses. Verses uh, 23, 27, and 30. Verse 23, If any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, 
believe it not. In other words, a private showing. <laughs> the, the fellows that I'm uh, spending a little time with right now at my home, they're eventually going to let the cat out of the bag and say that Jesus is coming to them first before he comes to anybody else. I'm going to read them this scripture and see what they do with it. Because Jesus told me, and I will say it to them, he told me not to believe it. <laughs> okay? That's really hard on people. They have to go hide in their little corners and things to avoid these kind of things. But these scriptures are very clear. If they say, lo, he's over there, or he's over there, or he's... Don't believe it. We ought to read the very next verse for the context of his statement. He says, there shall arise false Christ and false prophets. So now we know what a false prophet is. He says this. <laughs> oh, lo, he's over there. All right. Uh, verse, uh, let's see, 27. Is that what I said? I have to keep referring back here. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now we've all probably been exposed to lightning. And you can just ask the person this because they know. When you close your eyes and there's lightning, can you not see that lightning just because you close your eyes? <laughs> you still see it. <laughs> That's what Jesus meant. There's no way you can avoid this. As the lightning shines across the sky from one side to the other, you can't go any place to pretend it's not happening. <laughs> okay? You can see it. You know. Verse 30. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. This is not a secret. All the tribes, it says, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So there is no such thing as a secret. With just these few scriptures, it's impossible to maintain a secret. So the coming of Jesus is personal. It's visible. It's glorious. And it's seen by all the living people on the earth. Well, why is it coming back? Now you're going to punch some more holes in some other areas of thinking. You know, you don't want to bring up a lot of doctrines at this point. You just want to lead them to see what the Bible says about things they're not clear on. And it's opening the way because the people who believe that, that when you die, you go to heaven. Well, what goes to heaven? Well, according to that idea, you're pure spirit with no body. Well, if it's a pure spirit with no body, how does it think? How does it see? How does it do anything? What's a pure spirit but nothing? We went through that in paganism, pagan thought forms. But what you want to do here now is show why is Jesus coming back. If a person's already in heaven, what in the world does Jesus have to come back for? <laughs> so we're going to approach that now. Why is Jesus coming? In John 14, verses 1 through 3, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In the original language, it's, it's better. You believe in God. Believe me. See, so that's the way Jesus really said it. In my Father's house are many mansions, many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. All right. So the issue is here. He's going to prepare a place so Jesus and the believer can be together. Verse 3. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. Come again where? <laughs> to the earth. That means the believer never went any place. Jesus has to come to them. I will come again and receive you unto myself. It doesn't happen until Jesus comes back. Okay. I will receive unto myself that where I am there, you may be also. That's why he's coming back. 
because it's the only way we're going to be with him. <laughs> so the scripture is very explicit. He will receive you unto himself to fulfill the promise of that togetherness. Matthew 25, verses 31 to 34. We read 31, so we read that again and get into the context. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. Verse 32, And before Him shall be gathered all nations. So when Jesus comes, everybody's going to be there. It will be gathered before Him all nations, and He shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. So he's coming for his people. But when he comes, he's going to separate out the human race into two categories, the sheep and the goats. Okay, And there's no avoiding this one. <laughs> when Jesus comes, everybody's involved. And by this time, this person is beginning to sense things he, they haven't been told before. Okay, the second coming of Jesus involves a lot of things they didn't know yet. <laughs> you mean according to those people? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a good question to ask them. <laughs> okay, so all the tribes of the earth understand this is happening because this involves all the nations. 2 Timothy 4, 8. Remember, we're asking the question, why is Jesus coming by? To receive you unto myself, he said, to separate the uh, sheep from the goats. And now in 2 Timothy, it says, Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So when Jesus comes back, the crowns are involved. The reward is involved. That's one, another reason Jesus is coming back. is for those who love his appearing. 1 Thessalonians 4.16. Actually, 13. Let's start there through 17. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through uh, 18. Now, I said 17, didn't I? But that 18th belongs in there too. I would not uh, have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. At this point, you'll need to show them in their Bibles the footnote under that word prevent. The word prevent means go before. We will not go before those who are asleep. Verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, with those angels, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You have just given them their first study on the state of the dead, but don't even talk about it. <laughs> you want them to understand that when Jesus comes, there's two groups of people involved, okay? The dead ones and the living ones. And everybody's going to meet Jesus in the air one way or the other. But Jesus has to be here for that to happen. All right. So the dead are raised and the living are caught up. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, 23. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. 
So the scripture says every man is going to be made alive, and it says every man in his order. You can't tell them the whole thing yet, the first resurrection, the second resurrection. You just want them to know that when Jesus comes, the Christians are going to be raised. That's the important element here. Christ is the first one. That, that's, that is in terms of importance. He's the first one in importance. He wasn't the first one in history. Moses was raised too, way back there. But he's the first one in preeminence. Afterward, they that are Christ that is coming. Everybody's going to be made alive one way or another. Second Thessalonians, the first chapter, verses 7 and 8. We're still answering the question, why is it coming back? 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 and 8. To you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, he's coming to end the evil. And this again, we take so many things for granted. I don't know that any church organization out there ever discusses the end of sin. As a matter of fact, what they teach is that it's going to go on forever and ever. But this scripture is the first sign that God means to end sin one way or another. And there's going to be a destruction uh, by fire when he comes back. There are the scriptures we know that deal with this, but we don't want to get into that right now. We want to leave that alone. All right. The next obvious question that needs to be asked, we, we, how is he coming back? We see that. Uh, why? We have some reasons now. When? <laughs> so they're about ready to get into some heavy material. When, when you ask the question, when? Because the Bible said no man knows the day or the hour. And they probably know that text. <laughs> so, so when you say when, something's going to pop in their head and say, oh, I got them now. <laughs> They're going to say something here. Well, here's where you do it to them. And this is, this is what you want to understand when you're dealing with the human mind. You must try to prepare it to be open. Don't shut anything down. Don't provoke anyone. Don't create problems. Try to open the mind. And, and when you say, when do these people, you say, well, that's a whole study all by itself. We're going to do that one next time. <laughs> and they're going to say, well, well I want to no, 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 we're going we're to talk about this the next time. It's so important. We want to look at it very carefully. But there are a couple of scriptures that we need to understand before we get there. So let's look at those. Matthew 24, verses 42 through 44. Verse 42, it says, Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. All right. So although we don't know the hour, Jesus said to watch. That's very important. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. So now you've hit them with a big spiritual idea. Don't try to get ready. Be ready all the time. You have just hit them with a spiritual challenge. If they're going to believe in the coming of Jesus Christ, they've got to get serious and be ready. It's because they don't know when it's going to happen. <laughs> Nobody knows the exact hour. But next time we're going to find out, we'll know the season because he told us the approximate uh, signs. So we don't have a date. So he said, just be ready. What do you mean be ready? Well, we talked about the growing Christian already. So they can, you can refer back to that study that you had with them 
about what it means to be a Christian, how to be growing and developing as a Christian. But here in Titus 11, it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearance of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So you have just defined Christianity for them and to show why Jesus is coming back and who he's coming for. People who have understood some of this. He is coming back for a redeemed people. They understand they are to be ready. That it's a constant effort to be put forth to understand what God is accomplishing in the life. And they know what some of these things mean here. Denying ungodliness, worldly lust, we should have soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And here's where you begin thinking in your own mind. You know, when I finally bring them to the church, is this what they're going to see? See? These kind of thoughts have to hit you as, as a Christian. What am I going to expose them to after we've seen these scriptures? Well, you can't reform the church. You can't change the church. But you can let them know this is the truth of God and this is their experience, no matter what it looks like anyplace else. They are to follow the truth wherever it leads them. Remember, we read a scripture that says the children of God are led by the Spirit. They're not led by their eyes or how they feel. They're led by the Spirit. That is the same one that does the scriptures here. All right. One more scripture that you might want to give them to help them. Matthew thirteen forty one through 43. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father, who, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So when Jesus comes, that's the time. After he has separated the sheep from the goats, that's the time for the righteous to shine forth as the sun. S-U-N here. <laughs> In the righteousness of the kingdom of God. So the thought that we'd be going through the head of the people, uh, head, heads of the people, whoever you're dealing with, at this time as Jesus is coming, how am I going to get ready? How am I going to be ready? How am I going to be one of those? That's the thought that would be hitting them. And they were going to, they're going to start being very serious about these Bible readings. Uh, in your prayer, you can always, always ask the people, if they're understanding these things, is this where they want to be? Do they want to be right with God? Do they understand these things? And, and just get some sort of response and in your prayer, you include them with yourself that you want to be ready to. All right. In your studies with these people, you will find that we get through these pretty quickly because we all know these scriptures. <laughs> it won't go this fast in the home. It'll take you a good hour to do what we do in 40 minutes here. If not longer, because they'll ask you a question, uh, you'll wait for them to look it up. Uh, you'll have some extra It'll just take a little bit longer in the home, so expect that. But you want to have these scriptures lined up so you come back into your sequence as you're dealing with this. Okay, next week we will discuss in detail when Jesus is coming back. And that will lay the foundation for the third angel's message. They'll be ready for it then. See? And they'll see what it means in terms of the plan of salvation. And we will begin branching off now into the doctrines that a Christian believes. These are the doctrines that the Bible teaches. And we're not talking churches anymore. We're talking what does God say. And they will understand you. Okay. We have a little extra time today because we went through that pretty quickly. But do you have any questions beyond our study here today? 
Yeah, David wrote on a couple of us here. All right. This really shouldn't be on the tape if we're going to... Uh, yeah. This We have finished this part for the tape. Yeah. So I have control of the tape here. <laughs> yeah, I just shut off the mic. 